we've heard about lessons and some of the lessons from elsewhere. The, uh, just to recap and try to make the link then between those and, uh, and the healthcare sector, clearly the asymmetry of information that Paul was going through around the other sectors applies potentially in spades to, uh, to healthcare between, between Monitor, who will take over the economic regulatory functions and the trust, between the GP commissioners and the trust, between the National Commissioning Board and the GPs, lots of asymmetries of information. And the question is not so much whether they exist, but what tools and what do, what do we put in place in order to overcome it in a way that is consistent with delivering the right levels of quality at the right prices and for the right cost. That brings us to the balance between prices and the uh, price, cost, and the right quality. We heard a lot yesterday from the Secretary of State about outcomes-based pricing. And actually, one of, the, one of the central issues in that area, then, is how much do you use price regulation in order to provide incentives for cost reduction? How much do you end quality delivery? And how much do you use other forms of regulation? Do you put things like sequin and like quaff alongside of the regulatory systems for prices in order to try to deliver the right levels of quality at a cost that we think is acceptable. Again, Paul was talking about competition and the analogies with health we were talking about yesterday and a lot of that around when do you use competition in the market versus for the market? When are we going to use, allow choice to drive some of the outcomes in healthcare? And when are we going to use franchising and other types of arrangements in order to drive improvements uh, in healthcare? I think Steve's going to speak about some of that in a minute. And finally, on the point that Paul concluded on around evidence-based pragmatism, and particularly in that sense about the transition, in the fact that in healthcare we will be on a journey for, and Paul was suggesting, the next 20 or 30 years potentially. And the issue with some of the pragmatic decisions that are made in that transition is not to embed things that then disrupt your ability to generate efficient, good outcomes for society over the longer term. You could clearly pick out from that list any number of aspects of the reform process that's currently going on and examine it through the lens of those types of issues and the lessons that you might see from other sectors. We've decided to pick out one particular issue that probably sits at the heart of some of the reforms, which is the issue of designated services. And so, as many of you will know, what one of the processes that will happen if the, uh, if the bill is passed as it currently stands is that GP consortium will have to go through a process of designating services. Some services will be designated, some services will not. A designated service, according to the bill, is something where if that service were, would cease to exist, that in the local area, in the relevant geographic area, it would have a significant adverse impact on the health of, person, of the people in need of that service. So it is a way of signaling which services do we think we could not close capacity in that area without having detrimental effects on the delivery of healthcare in that area. And it is a way, in analogies to what Paul was talking about, of trying to distinguish where can competition be allowed to work in more fundamental ways and to drive entry and exit in more fundamental ways, and where do we need to regulate competition perhaps more strictly in order at least to manage the exit process in a much more, in a much care, a much more careful way. GP commissioners will make that decision about how, which services to designate. They will make an application to monitor, monitor, must accept that application under certain conditions and if it meets certain conditions, although that decision is appealable. And the process of designation should be reviewed. There should be a process of deciding whether services still need to sit in that designated, in that designated basket. The conclusion of that is, in part, that designated services might be protected from closure in some way, but they're not protected from competition. And as Paul was indicating, and even as Alan started to say, there are potentially many different forms of competition, both in the market and for the market. And the question is, in that process of designation of services, partly what can we draw and what can we learn from other sectors, how will regulation and competition work across the areas where services end up being designated? There are some practical consequences of going down the route of trying to designate services. In particular, as we were hint hinting, the need to regulate designated services and non-designated services in different ways. And the fact that and in order to do that, 
trusts are going to have to separate out which services they are designated and not from a cost perspective. So once the GPs, commissioners agree which des services are designated, you will have to have an accounting separation between the designated and the non-designated services. Something very common in lots of the sectors that, uh, that Paul was talking about, you have a set of regulatory accounts, the regulatory accounts apply to the regulated part of the business, and if that part of the business gets into difficulty for whatever reason, financial difficulty, quality difficulties, then the way it is treated through a special administration process is different potentially to the non-regulated parts of the sector. Exactly how this will work in healthcare is of course open to speculation right now. We don't know and rules have not been set out about exactly how this is, uh, how this is going to work. Uh, all we have to go by right now is the bill and the guidance that the, uh, that the bill provides. Following um, a sort of trend, if you want, following on from how, that, how the bill sets things up, that process of, of once you've decided which services are designated and how that works, you'll have to think about what the right cost base is. So in this, uh, what, are the co what is the cost base that applies to the designated bit of the trust business and what is the cost base that applies to the non-designated bit of the trust business? How does that affect investment decisions going forward? If, uh, if you want to make investment decisions in the designated area, how will that be regulated and what role will Monitor play, National Commissioning Board and others play in that process? And how, what is the relationship going to be between the designated services and the other parts of the business? Having established that cost base, if you will, and that separation between what's designated and what's not, lots of the themes that Paul was talking about then come to bear. And so how will, quality serve, how will quality incentives be created across the designated and not designated bits? What will be the role? Will we use prices and the price controls that will be in place in the designated services, or will we use sequin-like measures, other measures in order to provide incentives to deliver quality? Uh, in the designated areas where competition might have less of a bite. The competition issues that Paul was talking about around vertical integration. What happens if trusts try to integrate vertically where one component of that vertical merger is a designated service and another component is not, for example, merging into community provision, into social care provision, where you might have areas that you might expect, at, at least at this stage, not to be designated versus other areas that might be. And how will, and how, to what extent will we care so much about the horizontal merger issues? If two designated services merge horizontally, do we think that that's a significant loss in competition and ability to drive improved outcomes, or actually do we not worry about that so much? And finally, of course, price regulation. How are tariffs going to be set in the designated versus the non-designated. Do we need to set tariffs, going back to the, the, uh, the FT headline potentially, do we need to set maximum prices in the non-designated areas or are they non-designated precisely because we think quality is more observable in some of those areas and people might be able to compete on price? And in the designated areas, how is that going to, uh, how is that going to affect prices and how do we drive efficiency in areas where trusts might know that they're protected in some ways from exit and from the consequences of competition in those areas. And needless to say, cutting across all of this, as we all know very well, huge asymmetries and potentially, at least currently, even lack of information about what the cost bases look like, about how the trusts are going to run the services, and about how the regulatory structures are going to interact with, interact with all of that. Just by way in, of conclu in conclusion, really, it's perhaps worth thinking about that in slightly more concrete terms, and this might come out in some of the sessions that, uh, that are going on, so I won't go through it in much detail, but what are the scenarios that might emerge from this process of designating services, and how might then a regulator have to react to those scenarios? How might choice and competition and price regulation affect those circumstances? And so what happens if the decision is that all services, say in some rural areas, end up being designated because we can't afford to have any capacity exit that market in order to preserve the health outcomes? What are the implications for how choice and price regulation works? What happens if A&E everywhere is designated? And therefore, that you have a, at the core of many trusts a service that is, that is protected. That might not be the case. What happens if adjoining GP commissioning consortia designate different services? And so you have a situation where trusts in nearby areas 
um, have to make different decisions and can make different decisions and have different flexibilities about how they manage capacity and about how the regulator reacts to capacity in those areas. And what happens if basically all the costly services end up being designated and the ability to challenge some of that designation and how that process will work. These really are all questions that are up in the air. And so there is a debate to be had around, the, around this process. None of these, and the reason that I've sort of gone through a list of questions as opposed to a list of answers, is that all of this is very much up for debate. And I think part of the lessons that we've drawn in looking at some of the other sectors in the economy is that there are lessons that you can pick from those. There are ways of thinking about some of these issues. And the careful point that we have to make then is how do we apply them to health given the special circumstances in health, given the plethora of products, services, the issues over quality that we all know exist with healthcare. I'll leave it there. Thank you.